Hey everybody, welcome back. It's day 24. April 16th, a Thursday, almost through another week. Uh, so welcome back. Good morning, everybody. Wow, another week. So Kelly, what have you been reading? Uh, you know, in this time of stress, I need a little bit of escapism. Uh, and so yesterday I started a brand new book called uh, Broken, this is my Kindle, by Don Winslow. I don't know if you guys know Don Winslow, but he writes a lot of like police, crime, uh, gritty, uh, street kind of stuff. And uh, I, that's, that's one of my favorite genres. So yesterday I, I started reading that. I'm a, according to my Kindle, I'm 13% in. Wow. So you're really early in the book. Yeah. And, and you have read others by him before. I have. Uh, you, you, a lot of them? I've read maybe three or four of them. And He's not the guy I, who wrote The Poet, is he? No, that's Michael Connolly, another one of my favorites in the genre. Connolly might be my favorite. Uh, I have other favorites like George Pelicanos, uh, Harlan Coben. Hmm. Uh, but Don Winslow, I really, really like a lot too. He's a really good writer. So I'm curious. We have a, a mystery writer here in town who's really popular in the world, Lisa Gardner. And she actually goes to my gym, or what used to be my gym before they closed it. Um, and one of the criticisms about her work is that it's um, people think it is formulaic, like the same kinds of situations happen. And I'm curious if Don, if like even 13% in, do you kind of know how it's going to go and that brings you comfort because you know what to expect or? I don't because uh, first of all, sometimes I'm, I, I don't mind that formulaic kind of feel, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I cheated and I read the blurb, if you want to call that cheating. And what I found before, what I knew before I ventured into the book was this is a little bit different structure than the rest of his books because mm -hmm. he, it has like six different chapters in it and they're each a different story entirely, but somehow the six stories were, are going to tie together. Ooh, I somehow. love that. They're going to overlap somehow or intersect somehow. So. Um, uh, knowing that uh, is a little bit different than, than any other book of his that I've read before. Very cool. I don't know if that's the kind of book I want to read, but it's, it's interesting to listen to you talk about it. Yeah. So, well, as I said, my dad was a police officer, so uh, I've always really, really liked the genre. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and I find it a pretty easy entry. Like it grabbed me right away. So. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's escapism in a time where I think escapism is warranted. Absolutely. Hmm. So what are you reading? Um, I'm rereading something. I've actually, I don't know if this is true for you, but I have found it really hard to keep reading. I have um, at the moment seven different books that I've started and I'm struggling with staying with them, which is not like me. Um, I think it's hard for me to I've been reading a lot of poetry, but I restarted a novel that um, I read about 10 years ago. So it really is reading like a new um, story. And it's called The Cellist of Sarajevo. Mm. And the story is, um, I'm going to try to pull it up here so people can see. Um, they have changed the cover. I'm going to put it, link it up when we... Um, when I put the notes in Padlet, because it won't come up, it's just black instead of the cover of the book. But it's a true story from Sarajevo that's been fictionalized. And the story was that during um, the siege of Sarajevo, when all the soldiers were on the hills that surrounded Sarajevo, people were left in town and you could flee, but if you did, you were gonna be leaving the town to be taken over. And so they, this is three different narrators who are staying in town, trying to get water for their families or to get water for um, people who live nearby. And I'm so struck by how much it feels like right now in that kind of crisis mode, except that the true part of this that is at the heart of the story is that a cellist is in his living room looking out over the town at a bread line and there are 22 people in the line getting bread when a bomb lands on them and kills all of them. And he goes to his closet the next morning and puts on his dusty tuxedo. He's from a symphony. 
takes his cello down to the crater, the center of the street and plays this beautiful piece of music. And he decides he's gonna play it for 22 days to honor the 22 people. But by doing that, he's gonna be in a line of fire for a sniper. And so there's actually a piece, the cellist of Sarajevo that I've put on my phone that I listen to. It's powerful. Um, so at any rate, it's, I'm about halfway through the second reading. So let's talk about rereading for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you select this as a reread? Um, it's mostly because um, it feels these people are trapped in their homes. The only time they go out is to get food and water. There was something about the isolation that felt like I just, I remembered it being such a beautiful kind of tribute to humanity. And I'm not even sure what it's a feeling. I don't remember the details well enough to tell you what that is, but I, I just felt like I needed that right now. And so halfway through the book, what, what is most grabbing your attention right now on a reread? Um, the character, so um, one of the three narrators is a woman who is hired to protect him. Her job is to watch for snipers and take them out before they can take him out. And her character, I saw her as a very, just a surface level character because I was most interested in other voices in this book. This time I'm really watching her. And I think about how strong women are who are in the military. There's a lot asked of them. And in fact, there's a part that I just read where she said that it doesn't bother her to imagine killing other snipers and that that kind of surprises her. It's interesting because normally, I know I, I'm so far behind on the books that I want to read that I very rarely reread, but I've done a little rereading lately too. And I'm wondering if there's like you know, it's like comfort food almost mm -hmm. and returning to something that's meaningful to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Well, um, we thought maybe today uh, <laughs> that we would discuss uh, with everybody watching this idea of, of how important it is that we, we think that we should be conducting daily reading conferences with our students. Uh, we, we build in 10 minutes of read, at least 10 minutes of reading time in class every day. And while the kids are reading, we shoulder up with our young readers and we uh, confer with them. And in real time, without rehearsal, mm -hmm. without any idea of not what, even knowing uh, what books we were going to talk about, <laughs> go, we each just did a reading conference with each other. So I'll start with you, Penny, since you conducted the first reading conference. What are your thoughts about how that conference went? Well, I really treated it like I do in my classroom, which is what can I learn about Kelly as a reader? Um, and so I wanted the whole time you talked, I was thinking about what I wanted to learn and what I wanted to go after and think more about with you, which is how it works in my classroom as well. So when you said it was a book that you were barely into, that immediately tells me I don't want to go for like the content of the book as much because I want to give you time to marinate in that book if you're in my class a little bit longer. And so I might go after your identity as a reader. And I was very curious that you have an allegiance to a particular genre and a couple of authors in that genre, which is one of our goals, right? That our students develop an allegiance to particular authors. They can name, I like Don Winslow, I like Michael Connolly, I know the difference between them, this is why. That's such a, an important thing to know as a teacher. And I didn't ask you if it was related to your dad, but I was thinking that because we typically, you know, know things about our kids and go, oh, is this why? And so then, um, I thought it, your answer was interesting to the template question because I really thought you would say it was written like a like you know the same kind of story you could predict it you kind of knew and that wasn't the answer so I loved that you surprised me a little yeah uh, and I'm glad you mentioned and maybe we should just bird walk here for a second because we talk about this in 180 days our three goals for readers are that we're mm -hmm. going to increase their volume they're going to increase their complexity and the third goal is that they will identify with an author and or genre. Uh, so and that when just one more thing about that before you go okay. farther, that all of the things that we do are focused on 
the kid will become, you know, a more agile and successful reader if they read more, right? So that reader, as they increase complexity, which is a very natural thing when you get kids reading, they start wanting more. But that piece is not about us having to bridge everything for them. I think so much about how I want my students to read harder and harder books, but I want them to do it without me so that they are, you know, beginning to use all those things we're trying to teach them. So I just think that those three goals, they could be said about a lot of things people teach, but they're different when they're applied to independent reading. Yeah, and those three goals, increase volume, increase complexity, identify with author and or genre, none of those goals will occur without engagement. So uh, if kids aren't engaged, if they don't have interesting things to read, Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't have choice, if there's not an independent reading component of the classroom, uh, then it's going to uh, fall into fake reading and, and those goals are going to fall by the wayside. Um, I would also say that what was interesting that what you, what you alluded to is when you asked me where I was in the book mm -hmm. and I was only a little bit into the book, that that shaped the direction of your conversation with me in our and we'll put a maybe a, a link to this later but we're influenced by our friend donna santman who who we interviewed earlier uh in this series of um postings and who i talked to on the phone this morning by mm -hmm. the way but on page 62 of uh 180 days there's this chart that sometimes helps me to think about what I want to ask the young reader. Uh, and that chart kind of gets at the idea of where you are in the book uh, influences the kinds of discussion. You're not going to ask me on page 10 uh, where what's a major big idea that's emerging in the book, right? right? If, you're, if I'm in page 10, we're going to be talking about exposition or characters or where, setting or where are we. Uh, but you, when I talked to you, you were in the middle of the book. Mm -hmm. So my question to you was, so tell me in the middle of the book, what, what seems to be really important? What's grabbing your attention at this time? Yeah. So this is something, of course, the beginning of the year, we want our kids to kind of think about, but as, and the bigger idea, of course, is in the second semester, we want the students to be more in charge of the conferences. Mm -hmm. So the second semester, we want kids to come to the table and I will say, what do you want to talk about? Yeah. Right? Uh, but this idea, you know, if you're in the middle of the book, and I love Donna's question of what trouble is brewing. I love that, yeah. Um, is, is something that you could ask me, even though you haven't read the book that I'm reading. It's, mm -hmm. not, a, it's not a gotcha thing. It's a, it, in some ways, I think it's better, we've said this before, that, that it's better that you haven't read the book, right? Don't you think so? Oh, I do think that I confer better when I haven't read the book, because I get out of the way. I mean, I'm really you're going to have to supply all the information and I get out of that need to tell you why it matters. Yeah. And, and get out of that way of, of shaping the students thinking for the student, right? Because if you haven't read the book, you can't put your preconceived ideas into that. Right. Well, I think the one thing that can happen and thankfully um, teachers have moved beyond that though, is I, I used to see teachers that would, kind of minimize the importance of a kid's independent reading book. Sometimes they hadn't read it and so they would just assume it wasn't an important book or it wasn't hard enough or um, it's just a graphic novel. I feel like that language has shifted, but I think that how we receive what a kid is currently reading says a lot to them about what we think about reading. Right. I mean, do we really believe in choice or do we want them to make the choices we want them to make? Right. Right. So I have to say then when I when we flipped and I was conferring with you, I was the teacher in that moment. Uh, there were a few things that were running through my mind as we were discussing uh, the cellist of Sarajevo. Um, the first thing I thought as you told me that was and I internally I thought to myself, uh, I've read that book. And I had to make a decision in that moment to, to whether I was going to reveal that or not. Uh, and I don't know, that was just something that was kind of running through my head. And I think eventually if we had a kept talking, I might've come out with that. Um, so wait, before you go on then, why did you not reveal it? What would be the reason not to tell me? I, I didn't want 
you to transition into, oh crap, he's read it. I better give him the answers or I, mm. I may try to sound a certain way that will be more pleasing to an English teacher. And I just kind of wanted to see where you were going. It wasn't really a, an intent. I mean, it was intentional in the moment. Uh, and I'm not even sure it was the right decision mm -hmm. in the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was my thinking in real time was, okay, I've read this too. Let me see where she's going to go with this. You know what I like that you just said a lot is it may not have been the right decision because I think that teachers have been kind of trained to believe they're supposed to know a teaching point when they sit down in a reading conference and they're supposed to teach a strategy or, and they're supposed to choose the right one. And like that there's this almost like the teacher's questions as a checklist of questions that, are um, surrounding this impromptu teaching. And I find that it's kind of like with sketching, if I let go of it having to look like the thing, I, I, am, I make better decisions about my sketch. Well, if I'm gonna let go of, there's a right way to confer with Kelly about his book and instead make it natural and, and out of my own curiosity, I think it is a better conference. I agree. Uh, there were a couple of other thoughts that were running around my head during that conference as well. Um, the other one is that we talk about a lot is, you know, who's doing the talking in the conference? And I tried really hard. And if you guys want to go back and watch it again, uh, just kind of gauge how much talking I did versus how much talking the, the student, in this case, Penny did, you know, the reader. Uh, and really, really tried to make it very central that the reader was doing uh, most of the talking. Uh, I also try to subtly uh, let you know that I too sometimes reread uh, and that that is okay with me, uh, mm. okay with me as a teacher, and that um, there is a comfort sometimes in returning to some of your favorite books. Uh, I don't know that was consciously in my mind that I wanted to reinforce that idea as well. You also asked me um, why I had chosen it. And that made me do some really different thinking. I mean, I didn't expect you to ask that and I hadn't thought about why I was drawn to it. So I like that because I like that in the moment when you know a kid hasn't thought of the question before mm -hmm. and you kind of see how their wheels are turning. Yeah, like I said, there's so many books I haven't read. It really takes, it's a hard, you turn for me to go back to something I've already read mm -hmm. uh, before. I do that with professional books all the time, though. I go back and reread Tom Newkirk over and over and yeah. over and over. But I don't, I don't really uh, do that with novels, especially. You do with Hamlet. Well, yeah, I do it with Hamlet, and I have to say, I, I see something new in Hamlet every time. Um, mm. Maybe also we could talk about, you know, although it wasn't preconceived. Uh, and we didn't know where the conferences were exactly going to go. We are conscious as teachers that there are different kinds of reading conferences. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I, in book club, I talked about um, reading life conferences, which is much more like the identity kind of thing. I was kind of teasing out of you of, um, I want to get to know this kid as a reader better. Um, it's not about the content of the book. We, we may not even talk about the book at all, but where the book, like, I don't know anything about the book you're reading because we didn't talk about the book you're reading at all. And I think that's a, that's a way you might, sometimes it goes the direction of how come you're not reading. You were reading for a while. And, and do you remember how we talked about that sometimes you find something out and the way you answer is going to impact the community of the whole room? And I think about a kid who said, just, just stop. I'm, I'm not reading. I'm taking care of all my siblings. And she just like unloaded on me, one of my freshmen. And the way I said, wow, you've got a lot on your plate. And the way I just kind of listened to her, I could just feel it in the room that everybody was waiting to see, was she in trouble? Because she wasn't reading. So I think all of that, it's reading life, but it's also kind of the community of the room would be one kind of conference. Yeah, I mean, that raises a whole nother issue, too, is that especially with kids who are not reading, the conference, we try very hard, should never, you know, turn into a gotcha. Yeah. Conference. I mean, anytime I'm confronted with a kid who's not reading, the, the 
thought process as I'm sitting next to that kid is, that, of course, exactly what you talked about, trying to figure out what's going on in the kid's life. Is it will or is it skill? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it a problem in the house? You know, But whatever that response for me to that reader is, it's, it's always with the idea, I got to get you back on the reading train as much as I can. It's not like, a, oh, I'm disappointed in you. It's, it's okay, well, tell me, tell me, why, you tell me why you've stopped reading. So, you know, some of the conferences is, I think the term we used or you used in book love, and I think we repeated it in 180 days, you know, it's a nudge conference, yeah. right? Yeah. Let's get going again, you know? Okay, so if you were to re take a deep breath and kind of re-energize yourself as towards reading this book, what would be a realistic time frame for you to read? And I know you're babysitting your sisters and so, don't, don't give me an answer that's going to please me, but let's give a realistic answer. I'm just trying to put this book back on your radar screen and having kids make some of those decisions, but trying to move them forward. It's so smart, Kelly. I didn't do a lot of that until I watched you do it in your classroom. To have a kid make a goal for that particular book to get back to it. I just thought that was really wise. We always want kids to set goals. They do more. Michael Fullen's work, right? They, they will. But there's also that sense of, you're giving them that agency again. I think that's really, really cool. Yeah. And yeah. And well, thank you. But you know, and then sometimes it's, it's like a comprehension. Absolutely. Comp it says I'm trying to read it. I don't get it. Right. And so I think that presents an opportunity for a really rich uh, teachable moment, you know, to talk about what good readers do when they can get confused. Uh, not in a, you know, not in a whole class setting, but with this one kid who has this one particular problem. So really when a kid sits down next to you or me, it's really a, 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 an intense exercise in the teacher listening Absolutely. or to determine what direction that conference is going to go in. And it's so much about like adapting yourself to the kid. I had a kid who um, he would work he worked, I taught in the night school at my school and he worked all day in this auto body shop. So he'd come in, his hands are like black and grimy and he'd be holding Freedom Writer's Diary. And when I would sit beside him, you know, I distinctly remember him saying, I am three pages farther than, cause I can read three pages on break. So it was taking him 15 minutes a page uh -huh. yeah. and he loved this book. Yeah. He, he like entered every one of those individual kids stories. And I thought about Tom Newkirk's The Art of Slow Reading mm. and how he starts it off with, I'm a slow reader, let's get that out there. You know, this brilliant man, multiple degrees and, you know, and, and I just think that I knew that Robert was getting a whole lot more out of that book than I ever did because he was not just, he was really living that book and that we have to honor that and I don't need him to read faster and to like stop myself from being there. But there are times, I was thinking of what we call challenge conferences, where you might sit beside a Kelly Gallagher who's on his 15th crime mystery and be like, so as long as you stay in this genre, you see one kind of character or you know what I mean? Like what I want you to think about is how might you challenge yourself? Right, challenge conference. Yeah, just trying to say let's, you know, You've read 20 Goosebumps. Let's move on. Yeah. So I, I would also like to add that, um, you know, we hear a lot. I can't confer with readers. I have 30 something kids in the room. And I think that, that once you establish a reading culture, once you have kids reading 10 minutes quietly, um, I want to say more than anything I've done in my career, the, the sitting next to young readers, even if I only meet with three kids a day, three minutes with this kid, four minutes with this kid, two minutes with this kid, nothing has gotten my readers back on track more than the daily conferring with them. And so uh, for those of you watching this, if you're not doing conferring in your classroom, I think reading with readers, I think it's something uh, that maybe as you get outside of this school year, you really think about and come back to that idea and maybe come back to how we discuss it in 180 days. You know, it, when we interviewed Mark Fetterman at Eastside, one of the things that his one of his students said to me when I was in the building was they take reading really seriously here. Well, what do you mean by that? 
they sit down and talk to you about what you're reading, like again and again, like year after year, he saw that. And I think that the, um, the shift to distance learning makes that so much less effective because one of the reasons that I think is so important is that the kid who is watching how you confer with other kids and watching everyone in the room read is affected by all of that. I would have kids say, you know, I'm sitting here and I look across the room and I see Cody and he hasn't read in five or six years and he read the entire time. I want to know what he's reading. If they aren't surrounded by all those other kids, I think it must be very difficult to get that community feel to the importance of reading. Agreed. I think you've opened a whole new can of worms there that maybe we'll come back and talk about. How does distant learning affect, uh, you know, because we're starting to confer with kids on online now. So yeah, uh, we will come back and share that. But before we go today, I, I thought we had talked about sh ending our session today by letting everybody know who's watching that we're, we are recording this with uh, a heavy heart, with heavy hearts today because we lost uh, an esteemed colleague of ours, Jonathan Lovell, uh, who, I mean, it's, it's hard in just a couple minutes to talk about his impact, but Jonathan uh, was the director of the San Jose Writing Project, uh, and he was a whole lot more than that. He taught at Teachers College. He's, he's a, a legend in the field, uh, and um, unfortunately, uh, he passed away. And so, I know, Penny, that we're both very, very heartbroken because he was such a kind gentle, beautiful human being that we'll, we will deeply, deeply miss. Yep, I can't add to that because it's too emotional. Yeah. But, I, but it reminded us both of the importance of writing projects. They're just such an incredible thing for teachers. Nothing changed, nothing changed my ability to uh, teach as a writer. Nothing strengthened my ability to teach as a writer. Nothing more than, uh, going through as a participant in the writing project. And later I then uh, co-directed a writing project at Long Beach State University. Uh, and it is a career and, and life-changing um, uh, endeavor. And so, uh, you know, Jonathan has touched countless mm. people, both teachers and students through many, many, many years of directing his own project. And so it is such a, a, a big loss for us. And, uh, does say, you know, how much we appreciate all the other writing project directors out there who are trying to keep their sites going when the government is not funding them. Yeah. Uh, when, when, fun, when funding has been pulled from them, but there's just lots of Jonathans out there who are doing heroic things. But I know the writing project community and the education community as a whole are, are mourning the loss of Jonathan. And so we wanted to uh, express our condolences to his family and, and his friends as well. Absolutely. Powerful man. So with that, we have a special guest tomorrow for Poetry Friday. I'm going to say nothing more, um, but I'm really excited that we get to interview yep. a poet tomorrow. He's one of my favorites. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you all again tomorrow on Friday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.